to share the lunch hour with you. Uh, I will discuss for the first half of this presentation some issues around climate and clean energy policy uh, among Western states and utilities, focusing on the eight states uh, that we might call the Rocky Mountain region. I know that's bigger than this chapter of AWMA, um, but I'll try to talk about the West Coast as little as possible, but that's unavoidable if you're talking about the West. Um, and then Keith Hay will take it from there and provide some more detailed information on the work underway in Colorado. So you may or may not be familiar with the Center for the New Energy Economy at Colorado State University. Uh, the center was founded in 2011 by our former Governor Bill Ritter. Uh, governor Ritter went in office, did a lot of work on clean energy policy in Colorado, uh, including signing two major bills related to the renewable energy standard in Colorado, bill called Clean Air, Clean Jobs, and uh, I've heard many times, it's said many times that he signed 57 pieces of clean energy legislation during his four years in office. So when he left office, he had an interest in continuing to work with states across the country on clean energy policy. And that's what he's been doing uh, at the center for the last nine years. We are a small group. There's only seven or eight of us, depending on how you want to count it. Um, and we do a variety of work in the West and across the country with governors, state energy and environmental agencies, state legislators, electric utilities, and clean energy advocates to advance policies that contribute to America's equitable transition to a low carbon economy, as it says there on the screen. I'll highlight a few of the things that we do. One is Every year we hold a clean, this is I think our fourth year, we hold a clean energy legislative <clears throat> academy where we bring in state legislators from around the country. We usually bring them to Breckenridge, uh, although I don't know if that's gonna happen this summer, um, but it's a, a group of about 25 state legislators usually, bipartisan, and we do, we bring in expert faculty on a variety of topics and do a deep three-day dive on clean energy policy to help these state legislators get smart about energy policy and, and hopefully go back and run bills in their state. And there's been a long history of success with that. The effort I lead, we call repowering the Western economy. It's sort of an umbrella for a variety of things that we do with Western states and utilities. And I'll talk more about that. We're also doing some work with communities in transition, primarily coal communities in transition. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Tagan is our assistant director, and she's been doing some work recently up in Northwest Colorado, uh, around Craig and Hayden. Um, and we have some ambitions to expand that program this year, so we'll see if that happens. We also have two online databases uh, that I wanna alert you to. These are free resources. One is called the State Policy Opportunity Tracker or Spot for Clean Energy. Um, and that tracks a variety of energy policies across all 50 states, I think 37 different policies uh, where each state stands on those. And then we also have something called the Advanced Energy Legislation Tracker where we track energy legislation um, in state houses across the country. So check those out. I'll just say very briefly by way of background, um, I've been working with Western states on air pollution control programs since I went to work at EPA Region 8 in 1987. I spent the 90s at the Regional Air Quality Council in Denver developing state implementation plans for carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and ozone. And then in 2000, 20 years ago, I went to work at the Western Governors Association to lead something called the Western Regional Air Partnership, which is a state tribal federal partnership of, I think 15 Western states still, um, tribes and, and federal land management agencies, 
to address issues, the issue of regional haze and visibility protection at national parks and wilderness areas. We uh, have on this call, I see my, my good friend and colleague, Tom Moore, who now leads that effort at Westar. And I see that we also have Mary Ewell, the executive director of Westar, the state, Western State Air Agencies on the call. Um, so it's a, that's a tough crowd for me. I can't get away with much with them uh, looking over my shoulder, but uh, it's great to have them. Um, then in 13 years ago, and we're, I want to focus in the short time I have today uh, really on carbon policy, which has been you know, the, the thing uh, for really the last 15 years. Um, and as you are probably aware, in 2006, the California legislature passed the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, or AB 32. I think I, I, sh I usually have a, a copy, you know, of that somewhere handy here at my sort of like the Constitution. Some people. But uh, then in 2007, a group of Western governors signed an, an MOU to create something called the Western Climate Initiative. And uh, I then kind of turned the reins of the, of the Western Regional Air Partnership or RAP over to Tom. And I, in 2007, started working on the Western Climate Initiative and spent eight years as the project manager and executive director of that effort, which is the first and only economy-wide cap and trade program for greenhouse gases in the United States, or in fact, anywhere in the world. Um, and that is a program jointly implemented by the provinces of California and Quebec. Many other states and provinces were part of that effort in the 2000s, but um, in the 2007 to, to 2012 timeframe, but it was only California and Quebec that kind of pulled it across the finish line to get it implemented. And if, as time allows, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, I, I joined the center six years ago to help to work with Western states and utilities on the clean on clean power plan implementation. You know, clean power plan had a had a brief but spectacular life. Uh, but despite the dis demise of the clean power plan in 2016, I guess we would say, um, you know, the efforts at the state level and among Western utilities to, uh, to move towards a cleaner power sector in the West had not slowed down at all. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So headline here, Western states and utilities have established ambitious greenhouse gas and clean energy targets. And, you know, there's so many numbers and so many different, you know, baselines and, and by 2030 and by 2050 numbers. I didn't want to bog down in all that. Uh, and, and I'm not focused on the West Coast in this talk, which is where a lot of, you know, that work began. But even in the Intermountain West, and especially last year after the 2018 election, we saw substantial legislative and executive action to establish new greenhouse gas em emission reduction goals and renewable energy and clean energy targets in Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, and Montana. I provide some assistance to, to Keith and the consultants that are working in Colorado. I'm also working uh, in providing assistance in a similar vein in New Mexico and, and Montana. Uh, so these state policies um, are being bolstered by commitments from electric utilities across the West. I also saw Andy Berger from Tri-State on the, on the list here today. Uh, Andy and, and his, his CEO, Tri-State, they came forward. We worked with them and the state and a variety of stakeholders last year on what they call their Responsible Energy Plan, which has them uh, moving away from coal in Colorado and New Mexico and uh, achieving very significant emission reductions by 2030, um, 70%. Xcel Energy in Colorado in December 2018 set a 100% clean by 2050 goal, but more importantly, sent an, set a goal of 80% by 2030. Um, recently, Arizona Public Service Company, Public Service Company of New Mexico, Envy Energy, Pacificor, 
uh, you know, you really can't, Idaho Power, you really can't talk about um, the Western power sector and, and not probably mention almost every major electric utility in the West that either is subject to a state program, um, but e even in most cases is going beyond that and has established their own targets. Um, and even if they don't have a specific target, like, uh, like for instance, the tri-state one I just mentioned, they, um, you know, their IRPs, like in the case of Pacific Corp, we know the shift away from coal is happening and to clean energy in the West. And I'm going to focus on that. Um, and, and also, it's important to mention that local governments and corporations in the West and around the country uh, continue to demand and support investments in clean energy. So it's really sort of this, you know, three pronged thing. It's, it's state policy, it's utilities making commitments on their own, being driven in a lot by the markets, and then also customers and local governments driving this transition in the West. So because I'm a air quality guy, uh, I always go to the emissions first, you know, I mean, it, it all comes down to what's going up into the air. So this is EIA data, a little bit of EPA data here in the 2018, 2019 timeframe for the power sector, the EIA data lags. Um, and so this is the eight Western states. So the, the eight, the eight of the 11 states in the Western interconnect minus the West Coast, million tons of carbon dioxide. This is just carbon dioxide emissions, energy related. And what you know, what you can see is what we already know about what's happening really across the country in terms of progress on emissions reductions. And that's that we've seen, we're seeing significant reductions in the electric power sector. I think that's uh, something, it's, it's over a 20% reduction to 23% maybe from 2005 to 2019. Um, I would go getting you know, two thirds or more of the way towards the the goals that the clean power plan had established for 2030, and we're not even uh, through 2020 yet. Then the transportation sector, and you know one of the narratives that we've heard about carbon emissions in the United States several years ago, I, I think it was 2016 maybe when when transportation emissions eclipsed the power sector as the the top source of emissions, and that's true nationally. Um, but if you look at just these eight Western states, it's not the case. Um, it's uh, still uh, the power sector. Uh, the difference, of course, is that the power sector is coming down and the transportation sector has flattened out. This is the 2008 recession, basically. And in fact, since 2012, and this is true here as well as nationally, Emissions from the transportation sector have increased, not a lot, but have increased every year since 2012. And then residential and commercial and industrial emissions basically flat. So when you consider these ambitious goals that states have set um, or that state legislatures have set um, to achieve, you know, sort of the, the, the standard, if you will, is like 45 to 50 percent by 2030. Um, these are very ambitious and challenging goals to meet, especially uh, in the absence of meaningful federal policy. You know, the, and, and this story of states having to take the lead on clean energy. Somebody needs to mute, please. Uh, and, on climate and, and clean energy, states taking the lead. Um, it really goes back to 2005. You know, um, it was at that point that the Kyoto Protocol kicked in, and the and the U.S. opted out of that, and that's when a, states really started to step in. You know, California with AB 32 in 2006, the northeastern states with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative at that same time, um, and so now we're still in that mode. 15 years later. Um, and states are are leading the charge. And that's good news, but it's also really hard, um, not only in the absence of supporting federal policies, but now in a dynamic where um, the federal 
many of the federal programs and rules that we had in place or incentives are being rolled back on, on autos, on power plants, on renewable energy. So, you know, where are we going? Obviously, that question, if we were having this uh, having this talk three months ago, would have been one story. Now, who knows? You know, what, what the impact of COVID and the economic uh, recession is going to be long term on emissions is anyone's guess. And, you know, uh, it's diving very deep on that question is probably more than I have time for. But it, it's it's interesting. You know, I um, so I'll just move on. But I want to this is just I just want to kind of make the this point using the national transportation sector emissions um, that you know, here's the 2008 recession, you know, and emissions bottomed out in 2012, but then they creep up. So I wouldn't be at all surprised uh, if we see a similar thing over the next few years. Um, and then by 2025, you know, we've, we've sort of see a similar curve to this one. This is just for transportation, but it's, it points out how challenging uh, this issue of addressing transportation emissions is um, not just in, a, in an, any individual state or region, but also nationally. And I just, just one thing I wanted to say kind of back on this long-term trend slide, you know, the, the I mentioned Kyoto kicked in in 2005. The US target under Kyoto was 7% below 1990 levels by 2012. We still haven't hit that in 2018 when you look at the latest EPA data. We're still above 1990 levels by a few percent. We're now, sort of the, then that was replaced by Paris and, and the US commitment under Paris of 26 to 28% below 2005 levels by 2025. By 2018, we were not quite at 10%. So it seems that, you know, these, despite this dramatic transition that's happening in the electric power sector, if you look at greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the whole, uh, it, you know, there's there's a not that much progress that's been made and a lot of challenges ahead and a lot of those challenges are just going to be harder now in the next few years. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the power sector uh, for about six minutes and then turn it over to Keith. Um, I think everyone's on this call is probably aware that there are three power grids in the West and we're here to talk about the Western interconnect. There's very limited inner ties between the West and the other grids. Um, and I'm going to break that down even, well, not, oops, wrong slide. Uh, um, before I get to that one, just want to point out that one of the things that's unique about the West outside of California, similar to the Southeast, we have no um, independent system operator or regional transmission organization, which is to say we have no organized wholesale electricity market in the West. And we, one of the things we are starting to work on now is an effort with Western state energy officials, with utilities, some of the renewable energy companies, clean energy advocates to start talking about, you know, how to integrate um, all of these state policies, because not only do we have these 100% clean and very ambitious clean energy targets on the West Coast, we now have them across the Intermountain West, We've got companies making their own commitments, and yet we're still in a in a situation where all of this is being managed among 38 different balancing authorities in the West. I don't know if it's still exactly 38. This map's been around a long time, may even be more, but you get the idea. Um, so all of these transactions are being done on a bilateral basis, and when you're trying to integrate. Uh, diverse resources across a large region, and you're trying to comply, uh, if you're a utility, with multiple state uh, targets and mandates, you know, this is very challenging. This is sort of no way to run a railroad, if you will. Um, and so, you know, the, the happy day when there's a regional transmission organization or two uh, in the West uh, may come, but in the meantime, the things are moving ahead and we're doing some work with states and utilities in that area. And this, these two graphs, and I'm going to take a few minutes here 
um, and let you absorb these. This is EIA data. You can go on their electricity data browser yourself and make your own uh, squiggly lines if you like. Um, and what I've done here, and these, these two charts are the same in terms of the scale, okay, and the time period um, and the categories. The difference is this is the eight Western states and this is net generation um, in thousand megawatt hours. And so it's it's thousands of thousands megawatt hours, which so these are, so that's 200 terawatt hours. This is a 12 month rolling total. So these are sort of an annualized number. And this data goes all the way through February of 2020. So you know this data point is the 12 months preceding February 2020, so it's a rolling total. And what you see in the uh, in the eight Intermountain West states is, first of all, a huge reduction in coal. I think that's almost a 40% reduction in coal generation, really just in about six years. Okay, so this this is going down fast, and we know that many other coal plants are going to be retiring in the next five to ten years. We do see an increase in gas. But we also see a big increase in renewables and this, you know, with hydro and nuclear staying pretty flat. If you then look at the entire 11 Western states, you see a, a very different picture. You know, the, the eight states produce about half of the power on the Western grid and the West Coast states produce the other half. And what's notable there, of course, is, first of all, the hydro, the red line. OK, so it's down here at, you know, 40 or less than 40. And now we're up here at 200 terawatt hours. So, you know, huge uh, hydro resources. What's also interesting is that, you know, it, the variability of hydro, right? And this is associated with climate change now and into the future. Um, what, what can we rely on for hydro? You see big reductions, you know, in just a short period of time, you can have a, you know, a 20% a reduction in two years in hydro output. Um, and, What's interesting, always been interesting to me since I started making these graphs is how gas generation tracks with hydro. We have not seen overall an increase on average in hydro and gas generation. What we've seen um, is this variability with hydro. What you can also see is the coal line looks almost exactly the same, both in shape and in scale, and that's because there's very little coal. There's no coal uh, in California. There's very little coal in Oregon and Washington, and that's all set to retire. Um, but here's, you know, here's the the big story is the increase in renewables. And I I tried to get some reporters interested in this last month because I see all these stories about, you know, oh so such and such a region or such and such a company, you know, last month renewables. Uh, produce so much power and, and more than coal. But here's the story in the West is that those lines crossed last uh, early, earlier this year, I think at the end of January. So we are now on an annual basis producing more electricity on the Western grid from renewable energy than from coal. Um, and that's the first time that's happened. Those lines just crossed. And this is non-renewable, I mean, non-hydro renewables, right? If we go back, you know, and you add hydro and renewables, and then what nuclear there is, we're actually right now at exactly half zero carbon power on the Western grid. Um, okay, I'm basically out of time and, and I, you know, I, I want to, we can maybe come back to this after Keith's done or, or as time allows, but the way that companies are dealing with this, um, this mix of resources, this mix of economics, this mix of state policies right now, in the absence of an organized wholesale electricity market is through the Western energy and balance market. Um, you see the map here of all the companies that have joined that. You see information here on all the money that's been saved through these short term. You know, these are like hour ahead deals that are being made to balance the, the electricity supply and demand in the Western US. 
you know, there have been times in recent years, especially around this time of year in the shoulder season, where California was paying Arizona to take power because it was to solar, uh, because it was more cost effective than to curtail that. We have had a number, this map has not been updated to include the Colorado utilities that have recently committed to join the energy imbalance market. And those same companies with Cal ISO are moving to extend this to a day ahead market, the extended day ahead market, which is an, essentially an expansion of the, the EIM uh, to, to get more of the efficiencies out of the system and to use the lowest cost and cleanest resources. Um, that's not the only action in the West, and uh, the Southwest Power Pool, uh, which does have some interconnection on the eastern side of the Western grid, has recently initiated their own energy imbalance market, and you can see the list of companies here, including Tri-State, that are um, have announced their intention to be part of that market starting next year. So I'm going to stop there. I, I did have a slide on low carbon fuel standard, uh, which is an interesting program that California and Oregon have in place for the transportation sector. And you might want to look into that if you're not familiar with it. And then, you know, just this whole concept of market mechanisms. There's a number of examples uh, going back to the acid rain program, the, the EU ETS, Reggie, which I already mentioned. Right now, there's an effort by Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states to adopt a cap and trade or cap and invest. People like that better. I think it's actually more descriptive term for it. Uh, a cap and invest program for the transportation sector. Um, I, my understanding is that those states all need to get legislative authority to implement that, and they're they're way down the road on this. They've been working on it for years. And I think most of them are intending to, to seek legislative authority soon. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how the, the economic situation with COVID might impact their ability to advance that clean energy policy, because that's really the big question. Like, as we rebuild out of this economic crisis, what's the opportunity or what steps will be taken to, to rebuild cleanly for, for a way to say that in shorthand? I just want to point out with the Western Climate Initiative, which I mentioned, um, you know, implemented by California and Quebec, it's economy wide, covers 80% of the emissions. The first phase of that was from 2013 to 2020. And the goal was to get to 1990 levels by 2020. Yeah, California actually achieved that, I think, in 2016. But things are going to get really interesting with this program starting next year when it kicks in uh, to its next phase. And the target there is a 40% reduction by, uh, by below 1990 levels, which is essentially current levels by 2030. And this was adopted three years ago by the California legislature on a two thirds majority vote, which inoculates it against any of the lawsuits or challenges that that program previously experienced um, when it was originally adopted by only a majority vote because uh, a, two, a super majority is required in California to, um, to add a tax, and that was the argument. So a lot more to be said there, but uh, you know these, these market mechanisms are advancing in certain places around the country, but we also know how hard they are to get across the finish line, witness the uh, Republican Senate caucus, caucus in Oregon walking out and denying a quorum two years in a row the governor, you know, sending state troopers out to look for them, um, and two failed ballot measures for carbon tax in the state of Washington over the recent past. So um, a lot to like about market mechanisms and the funding that they can bring to, to fund clean energy programs, um, but also a clear understanding of how challenging those programs can be at the state level. Um, and yet, as I said, you know, we're in this position where states are sort of having the lead in the absence of anything meaningful happening at the federal level. At least that's my editorial comment uh, that I will I will end on. And now I need to stop presenting and uh, we'll deal with questions as Miriam and uh, Sergio see fit. 
Uh, does anyone have questions for Patrick right now, or should we go ahead and have Keith speak first? You can unmute yourself if you have a question. Let, let's go ahead and have Keith speak then, okay? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Miriam. I just want to confirm you're all seeing my screen at this point. Yes, we are. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Keith Hay. I'm the Director of Policy at the State Energy Office, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share lunch with you uh, this afternoon. I wanted to do a couple of things in, in the time that we have. Uh, I'll start by saying I agree with Patrick that states are taking the lead in the absence of federal action, and I think Colorado is a, a great example uh, and a great story uh, of what states can do uh, and uh, what states are doing uh, to meet greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So today I'll give you a very little snapshot of, of kind of where Colorado is with some of that, but want to spend most of the time talking about a, a project that we are currently working on that will wrap up uh, in early fall, which is a roadmap to, to greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, but before I do that, since some of you may not know what the Colorado Energy Office is, uh, we are a small office of state government, about 30 uh, plus or minus employees, uh, and we have four units within the office. I lead the policy unit. Uh, in addition to that, we have a transportation fuels and technology group, a building innovation and finance group, and then we also house uh, the state weatherization program. Our building innovation and finance program has done a lot here in Colorado to help uh, businesses and consumers uh, with low interest loans to make investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy. And our transportation fuels and technology program uh, is really leading the state's charge on helping to spend down the VW money that's come into the state. And we are using that uh, per an executive order from Governor Polis to really help build out a charging network uh, across Colorado. So this is the one slide I have to share a little bit of where Colorado is in, in our history of addressing greenhouse gas emissions. Up to this point, uh, a lot of that work has really focused on changing over the state's electric generation. And you heard Patrick talk a lot about that at the, the macro level of, of what's happening across the Western Interconnect. And you, know, you can see here a, a microcosm of how that's playing out in Colorado. You can see that prior to 2004, when the state adopted uh, the first uh, voter approved renewable energy standard in the country, uh, we had a little bit of renewable energy. But if you spin forward uh, from 2004 to 2018, you can see a significant amount of growth in uh, the amount of wind, the amount of hydro, uh, and the amount of solar that uh, are part of the state system. And, and that's really been a function of state policy that initial adoption of a renewable energy standard, the expansion of the renewable energy standard uh, under Governor Ritter that Patrick referred to, and then an additional uh, expansion of the state's renewable energy standard that's really supported uh, the growth of a robust uh, clean energy and renewable energy economy uh, here in the state. So coming forward then and building on that foundation uh, governor polis in the spring of last year released his roadmap to 100 percent renewable energy uh, by 2040 in bold climate action and it really laid out a number of different strategies and approaches from executive orders through administrative policy and rulemakings at administrative agencies uh, through last year's legislative session with the ultimate goal of really getting to uh, science-based targets for greenhouse gas emissions reductions and getting to that goal of 100% renewable energy uh, by 2040. And as part of that roadmap, uh, the state and the state agencies have really taken on a lot of different uh, pieces. You can see here uh, in last year's legislative session in Colorado, uh, the legislature passed and the governor signed uh, Senate Bill 96, which really requires our state air commission to do reporting and inventory on greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And that's happening uh, right now. Uh, they will have uh, deliberations next week on, on those rules. 
Uh, the governor uh, also tasked his climate cabinet and a number of agencies to produce a greenhouse gas emissions reduction roadmap. And so my office, uh, the energy office, is working in partnership with the Department of Public Health, uh, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Natural Resources uh, in conjunction with the Center for New Energy Economy and, and Patrick. Uh, as well as Energy and Environmental Economics, a national consulting firm that's done house, greenhouse gas emission studies for a number of states, uh, as large as California and as small as Maryland. And, and we're working with them uh, on this greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction roadmap. Um, in addition to those pieces, last fall, uh, the state adopted the zero emission vehicle rule, uh, which will now make Colorado uh, the first non-coastal state to have adopted uh, a ZEV standard. Uh, and that will be part of the strategy that we have to help hit those greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets. Uh, the legislature also passed Senate Bill uh, 236 last year, which was an update to work at the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, a big part of that put in place a requirement for Tri-State uh, to submit uh, an electric resource plan to the Public Utilities Commission for approval. Uh, it also put in place XL Energy's commitment uh, to get to an 80% emissions reduction by 2030, and it formalized that language and, and makes it an actual requirement for XL to file a plan for approval with the Public Utilities Commission uh, that will hit that goal. And so XL will file that plan uh, in the spring of 2021. Uh, and it will lay out a clear path for how the utility gets to that emission reduction uh, by 2030. In addition to the legislative work, there's also been efforts uh, to address the state implementation plan on ozone uh, and at the Air Quality Control Commission uh, to reduce uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which as many of you probably know better than I, uh, are short-lived but potent uh, climate pollutants. And they are also working on, on coal and coal mine methane regulations as part of that. So then the greenhouse gas roadmap uh, started, uh, as I said, with the, the governor's announcement of his own uh, roadmap last spring. Uh, through the fall of, of this last year and through the winter, uh, we were starting to build up uh, the state's 2005 uh, inventory. Uh, and I should say that all of this is predicated on some climate reduction goals that were passed into statute last year. And so that's a 26 by 2025 target, uh, a 50% by 2030 target, and then a 90% by 2050 target. And so the first effort within the roadmap really was to uh, help firm up that initial 2005 baseline that all of those targets uh, are based on. Uh, and to make sure that we're using the best available data and the best available methods to understand what the state's emissions were in 2005. Where we are now is, is we've done that inventory work, we've set a couple of reference cases, uh, and we are now having stakeholder meetings and conversations to better understand uh, what the state should be modeling for different policies and pathways to get to those emissions reductions. Uh, we'll then have a draft report available over the summer uh, with the ultimate goal of being able to release a finalized roadmap uh, by September 30th of, of 2020, once we've had an additional round of, of stakeholder meetings over the summer. Uh, feel free as I go through these next slides to interject questions at, at any point, but this shows you uh, two different iterations of Colorado's uh, emissions comparison and benchmarking for the year 2015. Uh, that was so that we could have confidence in the modeling that, that we are doing uh, for that 2005 level. And you can see that the uh, results of E3's pathway model really do uh, closely align with what we at the state had done for our initial greenhouse gas inventories uh, for that year, with, with really one exception, and that's in the oil and natural gas sector. Um, what we've done in, in the current modeling is really to hold fix those 2005 emissions uh, as the air quality control, uh, sorry, APCD uh, at the Division of Public Health and Environment works through some, some better modeling of the 2005 uh, emissions. So 
At this point, we uh, have modeled, as I said, three cases. We have a reference scenario that really looks at uh, where Colorado was and the trajectory of our emissions uh, before the 2019 legislative session and before the administrative actions uh, under the Polis administration. We then modeled what we're calling a 2019 action scenario, which depending on how you want to think about it, either adds on top of, or since I like to think about us moving down towards our targets, it subtracts out the emissions uh, that we're not going to have as a result of, of the 2019 policy adoptions. And then E3 uh, has worked with us to model an illustrative pathway to getting to uh, the emissions targets that were in last year's legislation, House Bill 1261. And right now we've really focused on those near-term targets of getting uh, to a 26 below 2005 levels by 2025 and then the 50% uh, by 2030. Um, so as we think about how we reach uh, those targets, we've really started to think about it as five pillars of deep decarbonization. And, uh, Two of those we think of on the demand side for electricity and fuels. Two we think of as being on the supply side for electricity and fuels. And then, especially here, here in Colorado, thinking about the non-energy uh, side of that, the non-combustion reductions that we can get from agriculture, from working lands, uh, from methane capture. So you can see on, on the demand side there uh, a list of, of different policies and uh, technologies that, that the state could adopt. Every, everything from energy efficiency and building codes uh, to electrification of light duty and medium and heavy duty uh, in the transportation sector. I will say one that in light of the changes that we've seen as a result of COVID that we're starting to think much more carefully about uh, is telecommuting and teleworking. Uh, we're seeing obviously a strong growth in that and really interested to see uh, how that can help contribute. Uh, we're also thinking through the possibility of low carbon fuels and then additional low carbon uh, electricity uh, generation. So as we think about taking those five pillars and then think about how that looks as we want to reach those targets uh, for 2026 and 2030. Again, here's an illustrative pathway to get there. Uh, you can see that the largest uh, wedge of all of this is really clean electricity. Uh, but I do want to highlight that we look at energy efficiency, at building and industrial electrification, and at transportation electrification. And really what's happening there is we are looking at taking uh, those emissions and moving those emissions from fossil-based fuels onto electricity. So I would say as a key takeaway uh, of what we're learning so far in the roadmap is that one of the strategies is going to be as quickly and deeply as we can decarbonize, decarbonizing electricity generation and then really working uh, significantly to move emissions out of those other sectors through energy efficiency, through building and transportation electrification, and put those into that clean electric grid. And that's really the, the first thing uh, we're seeing as sort of a preliminary uh, result. So as part of that, here's one snapshot of a potential electric supply under the House Bill 1261 targets, uh, looking at 2015 out to 2030. And I think what I wanna highlight here is that you can see uh, by 2030, and this is energy production, so measured in gigawatt hours, uh, the state has no coal operating on the system. Uh, and, you know, that is not something that we hard-coded or embedded in to the, the modeling. That's really the model picking the most cost-effective resources under the assumptions we've asked the model to make. And coal at that point in 2030 is just no longer an economic choice. Uh, so you see gas being that bottom piece of things, but you see a large amount of solar uh, and wind. It's hard to see, but there's a very small sliver of uh, CCS and, and biogas that are in there. If you look to that upper right side for a moment, you can see that the by 2030, uh, Colorado achieves an effective 
uh, renewable portfolio standard of 75%. So that's well above uh, where we are today and well above anything in Colorado that's in statute. And again, that's on a generation basis, and it's really a product of the cost effectiveness of wind and solar and as resources that the modeling will select to provide uh, the state's energy at that point in time. I think this is my final slide, but I wanted to end. Uh, we have recently released uh, a new electric vehicle plan for Colorado. Uh, and as I said a minute ago, um, we really have focused on cleaning the state's electric sector and then electrifying where we can. And we think a big part of that will be in the transportation sector. And so the, the electric vehicle plan for 2020 uh, calls for getting to 940,000 uh, EVs on Colorado's roads. Uh, by 2030, uh, and you can see that modeled here uh, as our as our high scenario, and that's the goal uh, we've set for state policy. So, Miriam, that is my uh, final slide. I wanted to make sure uh, and end with enough time uh, for folks to be able to ask questions, and I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Sure. Thank, Thank you, Keith and. Patrick, um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to ask at this time. Be sure to unmute. No questions, everybody? It means they were really, really good presentations or were they bad presentations? <laughs> Well, I will say, Miriam, thank you to, to everyone that's on the call. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the roadmap, uh, the Colorado Energy Office website has updates and information uh, about the roadmap. It also uh, provides an opportunity uh, for you to give feedback uh, and suggestions about what we should consider as, as part of the roadmap process. So I encourage you uh, to check in on, on the website regularly. I will also say that uh, we are appearing monthly before the Air Quality Control Commission uh, to provide them with updates on the process and the modeling. Um, to date, uh, the modeling that you saw reflects a, a bunch of assumptions that were pre-COVID-19, uh, and we anticipate that in June uh, we will have updated uh, both the baselines and uh, the 1261 uh, scenario to reflect some changes that we think may be resulting from uh, COVID-19. Great. Well, thank you so much, Keith and Patrick. Um, I wanted to tell everyone that we do have an upcoming meeting next week as well, where John Putnam, Director of Environmental Programs at CDPHE, will be speaking on CDPHE initiatives concerning PFAS. Details will follow in emails. Uh, thank you both for attending and speaking today. And um, this will be a recorded uh, presentation so and it will be available on our website. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Great. Keith. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it.